Uh, I think probably the best thing to do is in in uh, eager pupil mode, we'll just keep keep plowing through so that we can get through as much of our learnings as possible. And with that, I'll turn it to Jim Gibbons and the capacity team. Jim? All right. I will uh, just hold on real tight because we're going to move real quick. Uh, in fact, you can time me because I want to leave real time for Scott and Jim to go deep into the real learning. So I got eight slides we're going to do in two minutes and then hand it off to Scott. So somebody clock me. Uh, I've already thanked everybody, uh, but really. You but took really, that time out of uh, earlier. <laughs> But really, uh, it really the whole capacity group, I've never seen a, a more engaged group of leaders, people with busy schedules, and I want to thank them all and other council members who have, have engaged in addition to the folks that have carried, that, carried the water. Uh, really, uh, in terms of what we've learned, I want to talk through our objectives, our approach. Uh, Scott and Jim will cover our key learnings, and then we'll, we'll jump into next steps. I'll ask for you to hold questions till until we get to that stage, and we'll hopefully leave 15 minutes for that. Um, uh, this next slide really speaks to, you know, really our, the vision of, of really listening and really learning to understand what goes on in community. We had a variety of mechanisms to do that. We used the work that we all had in terms of uh, pre-reading and reading material, plus really tried to go hand in hand with the uh, effectiveness group in terms of how the research uh, evolved. Uh, to help frame how we went into community. Uh, we started with uh, national roundtables uh, here in Washington, D.C., bringing leaders and thought leaders, practitioners and thought leaders in uh, to really get their perspectives, but really continually build how we approach going into communities to listen and to learn. Uh, and then we moved into uh, two, round, two, two types of listening sessions, youth only, and I want to thank Michael uh, and the communications team and John uh, for their uh, engagement and leadership. And we had three sessions uh, in New Orleans, Houston, and Atlanta, and another one, as Patty mentioned, in New York on Monday. So we're going to continue to keep listening and engaging stakeholders. We had three additional uh, learning sessions in New Orleans, San Francisco, uh, and Cincinnati, where we engaged business leaders, uh, not-for-profit and youth-serving, uh, funders and philanthropists, um, and youth themselves, uh, to really get that cross-section, kind of all-hands perspective in terms of uh, really hearing what's going on relative to collaboration with a particular focus on disconnected youth. So in going to those locations really between March and May, uh, this next slide really just, just tells you, uh, you know, the level of effort that went in. I, I don't, I'm not going to cover it, but it just paints that picture in terms of a pretty intense schedule. Uh, the next few slides I'm going to really power through, but it gives you a flavor and an illustrative example of the types of groups that we met with at the kind of the national level where we brought people, uh, people came into Washington, D.C. We had a roundtable with practitioners and thought leaders, some pretty, pretty, pretty influential and successful leaders and organizations that I think bring good perspective uh, to our thinking to help the, shape the council's thinking as we go forward. We moved to uh, New Orleans where Scott really uh, was the point of the spear in terms of, of uh, you know, removing bumps in the road for all of us uh, in terms of the logistics and the coordination efforts. We all learned from this. Scott had, you can really see the flavor of in what in community means, uh, you know, from jazz organizations to youth organizations to, uh, you know, uh, universities and community colleges uh, within the New Orleans community. Uh, Bobby and Jim then led the effort in uh, San Francisco. Uh, and you, Bobby mentioned five sessions earlier. These sessions uh, were extraordinary in terms of en engagement. They were over a day and a half, I believe. Uh, and you see some pretty extraordinary employer and business uh, engagement, as well as uh, the youth-serving uh, organizations, funders, philanthropists, and again, youth. And then we wrapped up our work in Cincinnati, uh, where we had leaders. We focused a little bit more heavily on collaboration, but still spent a lot of time on the youth component. We had tons of engagement from all the regional workforce groups with their particular emphasis on youth. We had educators. 
uh, and we had a, a really just a perspective. I think from my vantage point, what, what I learned is, you know, collaboration, uh, really what, what um, Michelle just talked about, that whole leadership and alignment. But, you know, there's stages at all levels, and it, and it gets a, it's, it's rough and tumble all the way through. And we learned, you know, the goods, the, the goods, the bads, and the uglies. And it was pretty powerful to take what the effectiveness has learned in a real disciplined research and then really surround it with real people, real stories, uh, real community. Uh, so a lot of work went in. I know I, I, I flew through that. I hit two minutes and 37 seconds. <laughs> but uh, now to jump right into kind of the themes before Jim jumps into the kind of the details against the framework we used, Scott's going to kind of talk through the, the, the themes of what we've done. He's got fewer lot slides but a lot more substance than I just covered. So, Scott? Okay. Thanks, Jim. Uh, first of all, let me make an observation before we get into our insights. My observation is is that there's almost 100% convergence between what we're going to say and what we just heard from the effectiveness group. I could not find a single point that you made or a single source of data that in any way refuted the insights here. So that I think is a good news for all of us and perhaps we'll tease something out where there was a difference of view but I doubt that we will. Uh, my job really is to give you a sort of uh, top line insights at 50,000 feet and then Jim Canales is going to give you more granular insights uh, at ground level of what we found. Uh, the first thing I think we wanted to review with you were just the questions that guided the listening sessions. One of the things we made sure of before we did any listening sessions is, is that we had a common set of questions that we would use in every city. So as we were collecting the data, it would make it easier to collect it, to summarize it, and to draw insights from it. Uh, the first question really focuses on what obstacles are preventing youth from connecting to educational and employment opportunities? And likewise, what conditions tend to be present when they do connect? Uh, the second question really focuses around gaps in communication and two kinds of gap. How can we be more effective in reaching out to youth who could benefit from being connected to employment uh, and educational opportunities? And the second part of that question is, is how can we be more effective in connecting with stakeholders who really have a stake in this particular issue? Third question really was trying to identify examples of successful programs uh, in dealing with the issue of disconnected youth. And, and also abstracting from that are there some general characteristics that apply to all successful networks regardless of the particular issue that they're working on. The fourth thing was uh, what are the most effective things the council can do to catalyze these community-based uh, cross-sector collaborations with youth and then once again uh, would those observations hold for other types of community change? And then, of course, the last question is, is uh, we asked everybody, you know, you have an opportunity to give advice directly to President Obama. Uh, how would you prioritize our efforts? And uh, what guidance would you give us as we go through our work? So you will find that all of our data is really organized answers or insights related to those questions. Uh, Really, the next page is a summary of consistent themes. This is really at 50,000 feet. It really is. And as I said, Jim will do a deeper dive down into these. But let's talk about youth needs. And when we say that this is a 50,000 insight, feet insight, it is that every stakeholder group that we talk to seem to agree with this insight with respect to the, the topic up here. So when we talk about youth needs, and I'm going to borrow uh, if it's all right, Jill, from your presentation, because it says it more beautifully than we have it in theirs, we have to address their needs holistically. That was the most overarching theme. I think for all of us who said in the listening, uh, they were both uh, insightful and very painful to listen to. Talking to youth, who is the target group here, and saying, Unless I have a place where I can live, unless I know where my next meal is coming from, unless I know who's going to take care of my child, unless I, someone can help me deal with the psychological issues I have from coming from a broken home, I can't even begin to think about getting connected to education or employment. And if we had one insight with it, we walked away and saying, this issue really has to be looked at holistically, and we have to think about everything that we need to do to help youth if we want to get them connected. Uh, the second uh, insight was around communication is, 
and how can we most effectively communicate with the youth who, youth who could benefit from more educational employment opportunities. What we learned, I think, in all our listening sessions, the youth we actually were talking to were people who found their way to a youth support organization. And then we asked our, ourselves, what percentage of the disconnected youth in the community does this represent? In the case of New Orleans, it was a very small percentage. So the question is, how can we be more effective in getting to those youth that somehow have not found their way to a youth support organization? That's when I think uh, we learned uh, the lesson Michael Kempner said was that every single student we talked to, or youth that we talked to, at least in New Orleans, and I think this held true of the areas, use technology. They may not have had a place to live, but they had a cell phone. And they used that cell phone. And, and they were pretty uh, adaptable with technology. Um, and they gave us wonderful insights about how to be more effective. But I would say the one observation here I would bring out was the notion that they believe every single youth who is disconnected wants to be disconnected even if they say they don't want to be. And do not give up on a youth because you first approach them and they say, I don't need your help, I have whatever. Everybody wants help and it's all about building a bridge of trust and respect with youth so they will be willing to come into some youth support organization. Uh, the third sort of very high level theme was what works uh, and what works is, is uh, those cities, those networks that deal holistically with the needs of youth. That's what works. And if we don't have that particular approach, then we become very siloed and the silos are not effective in dealing holistically with the needs of the youth that is our target group. And then, of course, the council's role here is, is uh, if nothing else, we have the bully pulpit, and we should use that uh, as effectively as we possibly can. Uh, try to align resources, both existing resources that uh, uh, currently uh, exist at the federal level or state level or others, uh, with other resources we'd be able to be able to cobble together. And one recurring theme all the time was to build the business case for the business community to be more engaged. Because the general feeling was that if you cannot make the case to the business community, at least the employment side is lost. Because that's where the employment side is going to come from. Uh, the next page really goes over uh, very, uh, some specific themes by stakeholder. Once again, I'm only going to call out one or two because I'm going to leave uh, plenty of time for Jim to cover more detail. Uh, the notion, once again, uh, uh, for youth, and this is when we met with youth, and this is what we heard them say. Uh, obviously, the earlier the intervention, the more effective it will be. Uh, we need to have this alternative engagement strategies. The effectiveness group said this, youth said is, we have to have very flexible on-ramps, and when they get off the ramp, how they can get back on education and employment. This is not a linear solution to what has to be done. It has to be very, very uh, uh, flexible. Uh, this notion about, once again, connecting to youth, and youth gave us, by the way, some really interesting ideas. Uh, for example, in New Orleans, it's maybe be because music is our culture down there, they said, well, could you get a hip-hop artist who we know to develop a song about this that would encourage you to come in? Uh, you have to walk the streets of the neighborhoods. You can't wait till the youth come to you. You have to walk the streets, knock on the doors, and go to where youth live and exist and try to make the case to them or if there's a family member. Um, <coughs> and this notion about uh, more freedom to build life skills, that is, I was impressed by that every single what we call disconnected youth had developed survival skills and adaptability skills that gave them a level of intelligence that is not measured in on an IQ test or the SAT. But boy, if we could harness that in a productive way, because they have to cope with things that we've never had to cope with, and that took a certain amount of intelligence and adaptability, now how can we channel that into a positive way? And the youth told us that. 
Um, and I think my good friend Maurice here says uh, we need to move from sort of the de deficit model of thinking about youth more as assets and tapping in and empower youth um, to reach their fullest potential. Uh, youth serving organizations, a couple of insights there. Uh, one is we asked them uh, why is it that youth come to your organization? What are the characteristics that you seem to display that uh, makes youth willing to come and to stay? And it's all about trust, respect, and they feel safe. If those three characteristics don't exist, even if they originally get connected with a youth support organization, much less with education or employment, they won't stay with it. Um, and that's uh, important. Uh, the second thing we heard over and over again from youth serving organization is, is we actually should not use the term disconnected youth. That it has a connotation that I don't think we want anybody to think. Now no one had a better way of articulating what the alternative language should be, but everybody said somehow when you say that, that communicates something that's not positive, it's negative. I leave Maurice and others much more capable than I am to come up with what the right words are. Uh, I think the other thing that youth serving organizations said, and we heard this over and over again, is invest in services rather than institutions. Once again, think of this as a system-wide uh, sort of solution and invest in building out every aspect of the system, not just taking one organization because that will just reinforce the silo mentality. Uh, foundations and philanthropists, uh, I think the big message that came out of there also is don't just invest in a single program. Invest in systems that deal with the holistic solution. Uh, the business and the corporations, you're going to hear this uh, from my friend Jim and you're going to hear it from Bobby this afternoon. Uh, we really need to get buy-in from corporations. Uh, intellectually, they understand the issue. They want to find ways to help, uh, but we have to make a much stronger and compelling business case to them about how to get involved and why it's to their benefit also. Uh, I personally took a lot out of that session because uh, I will just simply say I went back and got my HR department and grilled them with questions about the requirements to hire people when I found this we need to rethink our policies. And every corporation has the same. So I think this notion of buy-in, and it was mentioned by uh, the effectiveness group about the criminal records. I mean, every youth will tell you they have a criminal record. It is near impossible to get a job, near impossible. Credentialing uh, entities, the biggest theme there was we've got to develop uh, educational opportunities that are relevant to them that are flexible in terms of access uh, and meets their needs. It's almost they're in the mode of real time, real learning for a very specific task that they want to accomplish. And uh, I happen to be in the credentialing business and sometimes we're probably not as flexible as we ought to be. And the last thing is, is whatever we can do to engage their, their families. Uh, in the process would be helpful, even though, as we all know, many of them are not with their families. But to the extent we can reach out to any family members to support them, that was important. So I'll stop there and... Yep, yeah, Jim? Terrific. Thanks very much. And I think, Wendy, I've got, a, I've got a mouse here, if you want me to deal with it. Um, great. What I'm going to do is actually run you through five slides that actually have a great deal of information and data on them, but rather than reading them to you, I'm just going to try to pull out some key highlights from each of them. And I think, as Scott already indicated, there's so much convergence between what we have heard that I think I can try to roll through this in about five to seven minutes at most, even though there is a great deal of information in these slides, and I would encourage you to go back and take a look at them. So let me start with, um, and again, Scott raised the five questions that we rolled through, and basically I've got a slide on each of these questions. So the first one had to do with what did we hear about the most pressing needs? And I think underscoring what Jill and Scott have already said about this notion of flexible and holistic services, it's at the top of the list because I think it has been the most consistent theme um, that we heard really across all of the listening sessions. As you look down the list of all of the other items on this list in terms of what we heard, I think that the key theme to take away is that of connection. I think what we heard the most is that what 
youth really want the most is a sense of connection whether it's a sense of connection to a caring adult who's going to help them to navigate this system, whether it's a sense of connection to their education, to their educational system and their educational opportunity, or a sense of connection to what might come after that educational opportunity. I think connection is very much a theme that really cuts across all of these, um, all of these ideas that are shared here. I think Scott makes the right point that the sessions with the youth were particularly difficult and challenging and you really got a sense for what is a very difficult circumstance that they're facing. But I would couple that by saying they were also incredibly inspiring. I think there was a sense of, of both hopefulness, a sense of aspiration, and a sense of really wanting to get out of a circumstance that they recognize is not a sustainable one going forward. So as difficult as the sessions with the youth might have been, they were also incredibly inspiring and engaging for those of us who had the privilege of participating in them. Second, we talked about what are some of the gaps in uh, communication. And here I just want to tell an anecdote that I think brings some of this to life. One of the exercises that we did in San Francisco is that we had two youth groups, one that was age 16 to 18, the other age 19 to 24, and we asked them to write on little post-its what they saw as their goals and then what they saw as some of the barriers toward those goals and aspirations. And then we had them actually go up and put the post-its up on the wall, and then we did sort of this gallery walk where we looked at what people said. And there was one post-it that actually I took a picture of. Bobby and I both sort of caught it, and I've got it on my iPhone if any of you want to see it during the break. And the post-it reads as follow, follows, my goal is to have a job I love to do. And then the person crossed off job with a slash through it and wrote career. Mm -hmm. And this notion, which is captured here in that last bullet under the first segment here, that understanding that youth want a career and not a job was a consistent theme throughout these conversations with the youth. And when we pressed on what does it mean to have a career versus having a job, what we kept hearing is a job is something that you kind of have to do to earn money to have a good living. A career is something that you're motivated by, that really inspires you, and that engages you. And that's the aspiration that they have. And I think underneath all of these, you've heard about technology, so I'm not going to belabor that point, but would simply underscore the point that's been made that social media and access to technology is very much at the core for all of the youth that we talk to and something that they have access to even if they may not have access to many other tools that we might have at our disposal. The third slide here is about examples of potential programs. And again, here I think we were focused more on attributes than we were on specifically naming programs that we thought um, were good. And again, you can read through this, but let me just say that one theme that I would pull out of this entire slide that I would call to your attention is the theme of relevance. I think what we were hearing as we were talking about what are examples of programs, organizations, or initiatives, it kept coming back to relevance that if there are opportunities for, for youth that are both relevant and contextualized to their situation, those are the ones that are the most, uh, that, that in a sense are the most attractive and the most engaging for them. So again, I won't read all of this to you. I'm gonna come back to the business point uh, in a moment, but I would simply underscore the theme of relevance. This fourth slide really speaks to the things that the council um, can do, and this was obviously um, enormously helpful and I think generated a lot of ideas and I simply want to call out um, a couple of items uh, on this one. The first one noted here is about establishing a framework toward effective collaboration and I think given what we've heard thus far clearly collaboration is going to be a central strategy to advancing the issues that we're interested in but I think what we heard at least from the communities that we engaged in, in is that collaboration for the sake of collaboration is obviously not something that anybody is looking for, but collaboration that is grounded in community and in a sense it is market driven. It's driven by the experience of the community and what they feel they need is something that I think people would find appealing. The second point here about creating the business case for businesses and corporations to engage, I think there was a key theme in our sessions that I wanna underscore for the group and that is this shift from business engaging in this issue from a charitable impulse mm -hmm. to businesses engaging in this case from an investment standpoint was very much a central theme and I think part of the messaging as we think about how to communicate to the business community. And I think put another way, that this is really a workforce issue for businesses. And businesses ought to be coming to the table with that perspective rather than the perspective of they're doing something good for their community. And to the extent we can help business understand how to build that ROI case, if you will, rather than the charitable case, I think that will be an important contribution
contribution that we can make. And then the final point on this slide is the third bullet there talks about using data to guide decision making. And I would just say from the youth serving organizations, we heard the value for those who are really using data in a really thoughtful way in order to measure and track what they're doing, in order to talk about the results and be able to point to results, and in order to increase transparency. I think data and information and resource became an important um, point. So those would be some of the key points there. And then finally, in terms of how we would prioritize our efforts, I think what we're hearing here, and the first bullet captures it well, is that to the extent we can play a role to help to reframe the conversation, and I think this will come up later today, um, in terms of the potential of this youth population to address our needs as a country, I think that is viewed as an exciting opportunity. Um, and Again, there are, there's lots on this slide. I'm not going to walk through it all, but I think at the end of the day, in these five slides, the notion of connection, the notion of relevance, the idea that career pathways is, I think, an important tool toward advancing uh, the set of concerns that we heard for this population, the ways in which we engage business in this issue, I think those are very much some central themes. Let me leave you with this point. Um, in the sessions with the youth in particular, I would say that if there was an overriding directional piece of advice for us, it came up a number of ways, particularly near the end of both of our sessions, and it was this that as this council moves toward whatever recommendations we're going to make, that those recommendations be as action-oriented as possible. I think what we heard from our primary client here was if this is just about sitting around and talking some more about these issues, that really isn't going to make anything different in our communities. And this really does need to be about action, it needs to be about change, and it needs to be about forward progress. And that is great advice. So I think with that, I did this under seven minutes, and I will turn it back to you, Mr. Gibbons. All right. Great okay. job, uh, Scott Jim, and Jim. Uh, Jim, so, Jim, Jim, can I? All right. Yeah. Why don't why, Yeah. Why don't we do it that way and just let's put them out there and then we'll try to answer them as best we can. Because I think that's the best way for us to see the overlap between the questions. That's a great idea. So, John, you want to start? Yeah. First of all, I just want to say how not having had the opportunity to participate in these, how encouraging it, this is. I I feel like there are ingredients there that are really encouraging. I guess my my question was. Um, to, sort of twofold, given their comfort with some of the technology tools, which doesn't surprise me, and the fact that youth are redefining collaboration and community um, and engagement with one another through things like Facebook and other things, one, did you see evidence that they were communicating with one another or sharing their own experience at all using those tools? Was there any community? And second, was there potential, when you talk about the potential of youth to add value to community and economy, can the youth's ability to use community or, or, or the, I think youth in national policy, youth are teaching us in places like Egypt or Tunisia how to use tools that they understand to redefine the notion of communicating globally and community. Is there a parallel way that, that the youth can help teach the communities they're part of how to have this collaboration using some of the social tools? So I, I just highlight that as a question. So we've got Bridge and, and Diana I see already. Uh, I just had a totally stunning presentation um, and the power of listening uh, to communities. I had the privilege of being with Jim in Cincinnati and one issue that we uh, focused on significantly was the role of employers. And when you look at Tony Carnevale's data, which gives us a window of opportunity that about a third of the workforce isn't going to require a four-year degree or beyond, but um, it's maybe something short of a, even an associate's degree. Uh, interested just to hear from um, your other com community listening sessions whether there were real-world examples of employers who took this approach. It's not about corporate social responsibility. It's about investment. There's going to be a return on investment to us as an employer in hiring this hiring, training, engaging. Uh, this population because I think at the end of the day if we don't engage employers systematically in a decent paying job for this population it'll be uh, difficult to make a lot of progress so just interested in any learnings and examples around that two different kinds of questions Jim Canales one for you when you talk about and I know others have raised it as well when you talk about the um, the importance of engaging business and making the business case one of the questions that comes to mind to me 
as I think about engaging with business, um, is um, the cost per, per outreach and that the decisions that businesses might make about which kind of employees they want to hire may relate to what it's going to cost, in fact, to hire that person over a sustained period of time. And so while we talk about making the business case, I'd be very interested in how one tackles that kind of question and makes an effective case that, in fact, it is in the interest as opposed to it's serving the public good. And uh, this may be a little bit, uh, I should have asked this sooner, but Michelle, I have an in a question to you about uh, next generation collaborations. And what you see is the difference between that and other collaborations. Some of the points you seem to make appear to me to apply to virtually any kinds of collaborations. And then there were some distinct areas that you left out that I would have thought to be central to collaboration. So I'd just be interested in your um, uh, explaining why you went about it that way and why you singled that out as opposed to the most effective collaborations period. <laughs> I want to start with the business piece first. One of the phrases I heard, just so we don't lose it, was take tax takers and convert them to tax makers. Mm. But that there was not a great amount of hopefulness of bringing employers into this system for other than dead-end jobs, which the kids didn't want. And if you got employers to take these youth, how could they get career training in those jobs? And who would take on the incentive of training the corporate leaders to help kids see this as part of a career, not a dead <coughs> On the collaboratives. Uh, all right, so then can I just finish this one thing? Are we doing anything with government agencies in helping them absorb part of this population into job training? Good. Good. And then David and then we'll let Jim try to work with his team to answer these things. Very easy. David? Yes, I'd just like to know, it was a great presentation. What were the surprises that came out to you from your work, what didn't you, what were you surprised you actually found out that you didn't expect going in? Jim, there's lots of energy for more questions, but uh, maybe that's enough. All right. The technology <laughs> and so on, and the was, so, so, yes and yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, as, I, as I, they were coming, I thinking, God, I hope I'm as good as Patty is at taking all that and reframing it back, but I'll take my shot. So <laughs> I'll save all the tough collaborative ones for Michelle for later. <laughs> Uh, and then I'm going to kind of just feed it back to you. I think really what I heard is two areas. You know, and it, if you think about it, it's about the youth and it's about the employers or the businesses in terms of relevance, right? When it comes together, those are the all others got to figure out how to be relevant in that world. And so, uh, especially in John's, you know, do we tell the youth how to shape how they fit in the community or with technology and everything else? Who's going to be defined? Who's going to be defining what? community really means and how it plays and how we connect. And then on the employer side, uh, and I think it was touched by both Scott and Jim, but I think really warrants some um, elaboration is, is that level of employer engagement and to what depth. So here's, I'm going to take a shot here and I'm going to ask Bobby to just expand a little bit on the employer side because she's going to be really taking the helm on some of that down the road. Uh, for just kind of take, take and, and expand a little bit on what, what you, we heard, Bobby. And then I'm going to ask um, Maurice and or Paul, because I'd like, you know, because, you know, some of us have already been talking too much, to just expand a little bit on that kind of youth and community, who's, who's really going to shape it in the future uh, mode. So if Bobby wants to take, take a minute and expand a little bit. Sure. <laughs> it's not fair to do to people, is it? <laughs> yeah, getting picked on by the teacher here. So, um, so in terms of the, the corporate discussion, what was interesting is that definitely wanted to see the business case, so the ROI. And, John, I know you and I are going to be connecting later today with the effectiveness group, really focusing on the why for business, and then this team focusing on the what and the how. So once a business is convinced they should, then what should they do, and then what are their on-ramps for providing uh, job access. Um, 
more broadly, and I'll talk about this a little bit more this afternoon, I think it goes beyond employers just providing employment, but also providing other knowledge, sharing their assets with the community to bring disconnected youth into the work world or to keep them on the path to education so that they realize that there is a um, endpoint out there. One of the things that we did in these sessions for the adult sessions, uh, Jim, someone from Jim's team pulled together a fact sheet. And it was just a one pager about facts about uh, US education and employment. We actually took this idea from Scott Cowan. And we also had some California data there. One of the participants from the business sector said, where's the page two? Where's the page where it has the ROI for business of why we should now engage? We understand the problem. Now we want to understand the case for business. Um, one of the things that was talked about was not coming through the charity door. And I'm just going to state in terms of uh, the discussion that we're going to have this afternoon, one of the things we should think about, and Patty and I were talking a little bit about this at dinner last night, is that let's not discount the philanthropic CSR door that a company might walk through, because that might be money that could be used to incubate an idea that the business side might not be ready to take on. So as we have this dialogue with corporations, let's think about maybe repurposing some of that money that may eventually lead to an actual adoption by the business. So if we think incubation or catalyzing. Um, so I think that's kind of I think I think that address a lot of it pretty well. And, and when it comes to some of the questions about the youth themselves, maybe Maurice can just take a shot because we really have come to, you know, some thinking in terms about, you know, who drives what. So being, quote, market driven and with the technology and the tools available to youth, I think Maurice can kind of address some of those questions. Well, you expanded actually <laughs> the whole thing. Um, one of the things is that. <laughs> I do that. I, yeah. Uh, I don't want to give the impression also that we're only looking at institutional solutions, that uh, the youth are part of a community, they're part of families no matter what, and, and sometimes the families get very stressed, and certainly I think we talked about how many youth, uh, when they're teenagers, really do have strained relationships with their, their families, and that uh, part of our role is really to look at uh, how we could rebuild those connections and relationships. And this goes back to two of the points that were brought up by Scott and Jim, which is uh, the issue of holistic and the issue of connections. On, on the holistic piece, um, your, your greatest view of what somebody is facing is really through the family and the youth themselves. And it's not just youth separate, but it is really the youth with their family, and that's the ecosystem. And that services are only a piece of what youth need. They often talk about services with us because they look at us as institutional providers, but when they get into their own communities, whether it's a cultural community, a religious community, whatever, that there's a lot about relationships and that we need to take that into account. One of the great things in terms of how we could have huge impact really is to go back to community, go back to these families, go back to the cultural groups, the tribes, the associations, the settlement houses that used to exist, and have those informal networks really be built. Those are the things that will sustain on the long term. We can build collaboratives, we can build programs, and the fact is we change those all the time. But family, community, that can sustain, and that is something that, especially using the bully pulpit, we can reinforce. So some of that holistic piece, I think, can go back to how we look at family and community. The connection piece is really closely tied to that. Almost all of us know that our ability to develop career and whatever is based on social networks. It's who we know. It's who you know, not even what, you, what kind of skill you have. And that what we need to do is start breaking down some of those barriers. Again, this is a relationship piece. It's not institutional. It's not a program. Uh, it is something that we have to build and we have to have an openness for. Um, a lot of times it isn't just with the youth. Uh, I think for most of us in growing up that a lot of our relationships and our social networks were developed because of our parents. And that starts at a very young age, who they hang out with, et cetera, et cetera. So we, you know, on the one hand, I think we want to focus on disconnected youth. On the other hand, we're not trying to say that they're not part of a larger ecosystem of their community, their families, uh, and even their cultural community. And so I think we need to look at those types of solutions. Uh, one of the anecdotes I got was that uh, uh, we were in a district in Boston where 50% of the youth actually were not graduating. And so the tendency was to then look at the 50% of the youth and see, quote, what their needs were and what the problem was. And, you know, I, I think we stopped and said, wait, wait, 50% of the kids are graduating under the same conditions, same community, same whatever. Maybe we should talk to them. 
because obviously they've found solutions. And what you're going to find is, again, that they've learned how to deal with some of the social service issues, some of the other issues, and that they've developed connections. And so uh, where we see deficits, I think what we're going to be looking at is really what are the assets? When 50 percent can graduate under the same conditions, I think they have a lot of solutions for us. So I think the bumper sticker thing is employ if we can get employers and business to think in terms of investment for their self enlightened in 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 light enlightened self interest uh, we recognize that youth opinion matter because they'll shape their future and the service and funding world recognized relevance <laughs> them saying relevance relevant is the key uh, we can really pull pull together some pretty cool answers. And what we're going to do is in continue to engage stakeholders. What we're hoping to do is to continue to engage uh, stakeholders, incorporate what we've learned so far into our recommendations, and work with the council this afternoon to kind of work through all this and form, final, uh, form recommendations. So. Uh, and I think this issue about youth and technology is going to play both in Michael's remarks, uh, but also in our afternoon discussion as we begin to s workshop ideas for a uh, recommendation to the the president because the the observation of the youth as assets and the youth as empowered by technology was inescapable. So there's something that comes out of that that we want to. Um, and so, uh, and even before I get to my section, which is next, I guess please. the there's something that actually struck me at Cafe Reconcile in New Orleans, and that was, and it goes to a lot of what we've heard today. It's clear that they have designed their programs and their program around the needs of business. So they, you know, it, it is all about teaching uh, young people to get into the hospitality industry, which is what New Orleans is so primarily about. So they didn't just come up with some arbitrary, let's teach kids how to do X. They taught them where the jobs are. And, I, and while I've not spoken to the business community, clearly they are providing you know, Intercontinental Hotel and others where they have a direct relationship with uh, Dickie Brennan's restaurant chain, they're providing them with really good employees. So, you know, they have um, figured out what the community needs and they, um, and, and they're supplying what they need. So it's actually almost, you know, the business case is obvious. They need good skilled workers and more than workers. They need, you know, these kids see themselves as careers. I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, but so it's interesting. So I, I, I think they, they work backwards to come. Kind of what does success look like? You know, what are the opportunities? And they build programs around the opportunities versus trying to shoehorn what they wanted to do into something the community may or may not want. Now, that was clear to me, at least at Cafe Reconcile. And if Bill Strickland was here, he would be pounding on the table to say, come see Manchester Bidwell, come see how we tie what we do there to the needs of the community as. Yeah. that also serves the needs of the kids, so youth. Um, uh, let's, let's move to communications because we want to save some time to have a kind of a group discussion here about what are our gaps and what are our big uh, doing, takeaways. So we'll do yeah. communication. Am I doing something bad? Again, um, again. If you hand me that mouse, I can fix it for you if you want. <laughs> Where's the, uh, where am I going? Uh, current slide, second, second icon. Yeah, from current slide, okay. Okay, for, first off, 50% to 75% of what I have in here is redundant, which you've already heard. So I'm going, oh, so I'm going to um, skip over a bunch of it because you've already, I've, you know, what we heard and what we agree with is so much that we've already gone over. I, I do want to start with just a little bit of a commercial. I mean, um, I really want to thank uh, Renee. Where's Renee? Um, Leslie, uh, my team, Stephanie and Megan, and then Mimi and uh, Tiffany from John Bon Jovi's organization have put in I mean, an extraordinary amount of work to make this successful. And even though we've only had three so far and about to have the fourth and it was a relatively small sample, um, there was a consistency of, and, the, and, and interesting, in each place the, the youth were actually quite different. But, um, but there was a consistency of message across every one of them in every session we had that was actually quite remarkable. And so the work that um, my team and John's team and your team and the, and the White House team put together created quite an extraordinary event. And I'll tell you that there's several things that I, I actually want to just kind of skip ahead and amplify here. How do I skip ahead here? Just scroll. Just scroll. Got it. Okay. It's backwards. Hang on. 
you know, we've already gone through this. We had three sessions in New Orleans, Atlanta, and Houston. Um, and again, in each of our sessions, we had a combination of the, of the actual organizations. We met about with about an hour with each of the organizations and heard what they had to say and what their needs were. And then we went and met with, um, with the youth. And, and much like Scott said, we tried to keep the conversation um, relatively consistent so we could have some shared learnings across each of the different conversations. But each of them kicked off with, you know, I think, you know, John kicked each of them off with a very important question, and that is, you know, what got you here? You know, what, what was that spark that changed whatever you were doing and made you come to this organization? And how'd you find out and how'd you show up? And that really kicked off a really robust conversation and dialogue. In many ways, the most important takeaway of all this, and we'll talk about some specifics, was just listening to them had more impact than anything we could have possibly done um, for them during that session. They, the, the level of appreciation and the level of, um, and it wasn't because it was bon, John Bon Jovi, because frankly, some of the kids were thrilled that it was John Bon Jovi. Some of the kids didn't know John Bon Jovi even was. But the fact is that, um, but that the fact that the White House was coming to listen to them and the fact that we really actually spend most of our time listening and not a lot of time talking had a huge impact <laughs> on their thinking and actually reinforced many of where they've come. The other thing that's important is that all the youth we talked to are successful today. So um, these are, you know, this was all about why they became successful and why the programs worked. And again, you heard a lot of it today already. Um, so let me kind of go through all this. I'm, I'm going backwards again. Um, so we heard a lot about, about I mean, the good news and the bad news is that the most important thing we found out is really simple and unbelievably hard at the same time. It's about one thing. You, you call the connections. I'd say a little deeper. It's about trust. Um, if you can, you know, we've heard every one of these young people we met with for the first week, month, year there in these programs didn't utter a word, didn't talk, didn't trust anybody. And it was this ability to create trust with something um, because they had never had, almost all of them were homeless at a young age, had been through foster care and been abused, um, had parents that were non-supportive, uh, drugs, most of them had been in prison at some point, or many, um, you know, uh, unwed mothers, etc. And they had no one to trust. So if you could not establish trust, and that's an amorphous issue, um, it didn't matter what you did. They weren't going to listen, they weren't going to participate, there wasn't, it wasn't about a job. It was, first and foremost, you had to create that foundation of trust. Obviously, we talked about the needs, you know, the, a lot of basics. But you know, really, in the end, it really came down to three things. And, and each of them have 15 different subsets. But basically, if I can trust you, teach me job skills and get me a GED. Um, that was pretty much it in a nutshell. Job skills were the single most, after trust, job skills were the single most important thing. I mean, life skills, not job skills, life skills were the single most important thing make me accountable, make me responsible, um, uh, teach me how to be out there in society, teach me how to get a job, teach me how to get a career. Uh, and then I need a GED. And if I have that, because I think a lot of what we have to figure out is that when we define career, they define career very different than we do. I mean, and so career to them is not necessarily going to law school and going to Goldman Sachs. It's not that at all. Career to them is that they were the, the youngest fry cook in the history of Dickie Brennan's. And they were proud to wear, proud. And they go home now wearing their chef pants, where they used to get beat up for it. Um, pride, so there wasn't just career, it was, it was pride in what they were doing. Um, so we kept hearing that I was the youngest person here, I was the first person here, I now have a job here. And so their definition of career was very different, and I think it's, it's less about career and, mo and more about pride in what they are doing, because they are defining career in many ways as pride. And so I think there's a real definition, and we have to understand that what they're seeking in a career, not every one of them, but what they're seeking in a career 
it may be different than what our children seek in a career, but to them it was a career, it wasn't a job. And every one of them felt the same way. Uh, their motivations were, you know, all sort of the same, I mean, but with, with, with obviously differences, personal, survival, professional. Um, they needed accessibility, they needed personalization, they needed relationships, they needed accountability, they needed to be part of something bigger than them. You know, um, most of the young people we had met with, or many, um, had already graduated from these programs. But they hadn't stopped becoming part of that. Most had come back and they were now teaching, they were now mentoring. So even though they are now well on to their careers, this was, their, this was the only family they ever had and ever knew, and they weren't leaving it. This was their family. Um, but it's interesting, so when we talked about, so we had the three, you know, uh, I, I, need, I need life skills, I need, a, I need to trust you, I need life skills, and I need a GED. And it was pretty complicated. I mean, you know, when, when, when you hear from a young man who said, and he was really impressive, that, okay, so I've, I've been in jail, um, I'm on parole, subject to my parole is get a job. And they say, okay, you're now a felon, go get a job and we're not gonna help you. He says, well, that really works well. You know, I mean, um, you know, no one's gonna hire me. So, you know, so I either have a choice. I can either find a program like I'm in today or I'm going back to jail. So the other thing that I know is, I, I know we all believe, but really came through, none of these young people grew up thinking, geez, wouldn't it be a great idea to sell drugs, go to jail? Um, you, know, um, you know, it was about survival. It was about options. It was about choices and it was about knowledge. And the one thing we heard time and time and time again we, if it wasn't for some friend of ours, or if I didn't hear about this at school, or, or if I didn't hear about this, you know, in the neighborhood, I wouldn't even know you exist, not, not the council, I wouldn't even know these programs existed. So tell us about them, give us the opportunity, advertise, let people know about them. And now with that said, every one of these programs is oversubscribed. So it's an absolute contradiction. So, uh, you know, they would say that you'd have hundreds, if not thousands more people just like us coming to your programs. That's the good news. If we just did some simple communication tools, that would actually be relatively easy to do. But there's a waiting list already. So that's a huge issue. So the takeaway, again, was um, that I came away, I mean, it was life-changing in many ways, but I came away both, you know, sad, but really optimistic that there's such, there's this pool out there that really want to have what they define as a career, really want to be part of society, really want to do the right thing. Um, they just had need to figure out how to do it. And, and so it's more complicated than that, but it was actually relatively simple. Uh, so the, I think we we'll keep going here. So, you know, what, you know, so obviously some of this is redundant. They need food, housing, safety, trust, respect. I mean, is this a video? Is that what this was, you know? Yeah, so, so we, can, we can give you a little sense of, does this work? Nope. So there's a video here that doesn't work, but the... Um, well, why don't you let Arthur Reed take over the slides for a minute? Okay. okay? Yeah. <laughs> Not that I don't love your slide skills. I just want to... Okay. We're probably going to be showing them Okay. okay. We'll make this work no, I'm here. totally okay with... While she's doing that, I'll jump in here. Uh, I'm Mimi Box with the yeah. John Bon Jovi Soul Foundation. And um, just wanted to point out that, you know, when we talk about the needs, um, they're not just talking about a physical structure, although it is nice for them to be in off the streets, but they're talking about um, the love and the trust and the respect that comes with wherever it is you call home. And um, when you hear the stories, um, as Scott said, that some of these youth tell, and you wonder, you know, what it is that drove them at age 13 to make the decision to leave home because it's better for me than living in a home with, you know, two parents who are drug dealers. That's a tough decision for youth to make. But then comes the question, where do they turn? And they were very vocal with expressing um, their need for being able to turn to a place where they um, <clears throat> can find some of those answers. And um, when we were, when we left Atlanta, Councilman Bond, who heard this message loud and clear, immediately went to City Council and passed a resolution that would create on Atlanta's website 
a place for these youth to go to begin to get connected, where they can have dialogue with each other. So, you know, already there are some um, uh, suggestions from the youth that are being acted on and that can certainly be included in our recommendations to the president. And so I think, yeah, great. That. And they, and they, um, I think me brings up a good point. I mean, the other thing that I think was really came across that was important, and you'll hear it from some of the youth, I think, in these videos. Oh, I guess you can hear it right now. But there's no sound. Is the, see if I can just say one thing, um, one second, if we can. <laughs> is that the. Um, we get to hear from you other way. Yeah. <laughs> is that they are, um, we, heard from e we heard from each of them as well. When they made the decision to improve their lives, they actually took their lives into their own hands. I mean, they, they actually created danger for themselves. They created, um, by making that decision to leave their pack, to leave, not just to become homeless, I'm talking about to, um, to improve their lives, their social networks, their friends and others, they actually took huge risks, physical risks, um, and, the, and the danger of for them personally to improve they all had to leave their social networks they all had to leave their friends they're all threatened because um, there's a real uh, dichotomy between those who are making that decision and those who are not so the courage to go do something um, is huge and that's why if they don't have that trust and they don't have that social network they will never be able to make that leap um, because of the real dangers in their lives by making that leap. So. Organizations and listening to what the youth involved in these community organizations are going to tell us about how to do things right. What are the characteristics of really successful community networks and how can we use them to solve not just issues dealing with youth but larger problems in our communities? And that's what the White House Council is all about. So we can then help try to take those programs to other parts of the country. So on behalf of uh, Scott and John and myself, what we're really here to do is to listen. They have so much to share. They have so many needs. They have so many obstacles. They have so many barriers. Some of the biggest hindrances we have here in Louisiana right now is we don't have a lot going on as far as support and programs. Due to the hurricane, we have very few things available for students, for the youth, you know, aging from middle school all the way up until graduating from high school, we don't have anything going on. Today we're in New Orleans at Cafe Reconcile, which is an extraordinary program. Not only do they have great food, but it really is an organization that is That's teaching the youth of New Orleans critical life skills and how to really become important and successful and excited members of society. The opportunities are fewer and far between no matter who you are. These days it's not uh, easy for um, disenfranchised or disconnected youth to gain employment uh, or opportunity. Developing a space, an arena, a place. It could be standing on the corner. When I see a young group of young men standing on the corner, I'm not afraid to go up and say, hey, what's going on? You need a job? So that's what we have to do. We really have to engage the youth and build that relationship. The kids here want to be heard, and we're giving them an opportunity to be heard, and you're giving them an opportunity to be heard. And they really do want to come in and have a job and job training and opportunity. Like the organization is just like a family. It's like a home away from home. If you're not giving love at home, they'll give you love here. And they're like this program that actually cares about different people from different walks of life. You can be any type of person. It pretty much rescued me. It pulled me out, you know, from the bottom here. Just being a youth in Louisiana, it's hard to find something that can save you. You just need somebody to help with, basically, you know. There's people reaching out to you. Just don't turn away. Let them help, because that's what they do. We're going to take the information from today and the information from all of these other listening sessions and really bring those together and find out what are the key takeaways, what is the commonality, and then, and then use that as a core finding uh, as we begin to develop our programs and our opportunities, eventually giving these recommendations to the White House and the President 